We are in a summer series called Hand Me Another Brick, the story of Nehemiah, an ancient Old Testament text. And we've been giving you lots of historical background. And if you've not been with us, you can go back and listen or, or watch these sermons in the past. I won't go into too much of that. But we're moving on now in the story of Nehemiah, really the story of how God restored his people, brought them back from captivity, the Babylonian captivity, and brought them back to the Jerusalem to have the wall rebuilt, worship restored, and the law even brought back to be read there. It's really a remarkable story of what God did through this man, Nehemiah, and a few others as well. Let me ask you a question before we dig into the chapters tonight. Do you ever feel, rightly or wrongly, do you ever have the feeling that when things are going really well in your life, do you ever get nervous like something bad's about to happen? Anybody like that? You're probably not going to admit it. A couple of you, yes? I had a woman years ago come up to, uh, to, for prayer down front, and she said, I want prayer. And I said, what for? And I was listening to her, and she said, she just started listing all these things that were going great. Husband got a new job, kids were doing great. Like, I'm like, this is, let's praise God, because this is very unusual. People come down normally because they have issues. I thought this woman wants to come to pray a prayer of thanksgiving because her life was going so well. And she said, I just know something terrible is going to happen. So I want to pray against it. I went, oh man, there's so much what I say here. I'm not sure that theologically that's, that's sound. But I think sometimes, though we might not want to admit it, we sort of feel that way, don't we? My wife sometimes says, I, I know people that operate like this. If you expect the worst, you'll never be disappointed. Anybody live like that? You know anybody like that? Um, as Christians, we are not to walk around in fear that something terrible is going to happen. That's not how God has called us to live. We shouldn't walk around nervous for the other shoe to drop. It's when we feel blessings in our life, we should be grateful to God who blesses us, but not fearful that he's going to somehow even it out in some Christian version of karma. That's not how it works. But we are to be aware that if we take seriously God's word, if we genuinely, earnestly, and courageously seek to obey him and to do his work in our lives and in this world, we will, we will face opposition. There's a difference, right, between walking around nervous that something terrible is going to happen because everything's going well, and understanding that living for God will mean, in small and in large ways, we will face those who oppose us because they oppose God. Sometimes it'll be direct, external, frontal assault, Sometimes it'll be subtle internal opposition. We're going to talk about that in the sermon tonight. Now, this is not merely a Murphy's Law kind of thing. Whatever can go wrong will go wrong for the Christian. That's not what I'm saying. It means that there are forces in the physical and in the spiritual world that are opposed to what God wants. God's kingdom on this earth will not run unopposed until the king returns. That's just true. The Bible makes that clear from beginning to end. I think the story of Nehemiah shows us this in a powerful way. Let's read the first portion of Nehemiah 4. We're looking at the whole chapter, not quite verse by verse because you don't have three hours. But uh, I do, but you don't. But uh, we're going to go through chapter 4 and kind of hit the highlights. So chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Now, when Sambalot heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria... What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he'll break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads, and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt, and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall, and the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. We'll stop there, but we'll come back to the text and move on in a few moments. Now, we've heard these names before, right? Sambalot and Tobiah. They've been hinted at before, kind of minor characters. They become major players now in chapter 4 and later on in the story. Um, chapter 4 is sort of where the, the heat of opposition gets really turned up. Up to this point, it's been sort of... Uh, taunts and talk from the, from the sidelines. It gets turned up here in this chapter. In fact, if you only read chapter 3, which talks about how each family was given a specific gate or section of the wall to build, and you skip to chapter 7, where the wall is completed, you'd think it went great, right? So-and-so built this gate, so-and-so built this part of the wall, so-and-so and his family did this section, and it all went fine. But for three and really a three and a half chapters, we get the story of opposition. Chapter 4 is external. Chapter 5 is internal conflict. Chapter 6 is even more of the external. That's not, it, it, it was not smooth sailing. 
I think this shows us something very important. Three and a half chapters, really, of opposition, of struggle, of difficulty in doing God's work. I think this shows us something important about those who genuinely want to obey God with their lives. The reality of opposition. That's what it shows us. We've hinted at this throughout the series, but here we see it face to face. The reality of opposition. I think there's a very common myth among many North American Christians today. I hear it all the time from people in our own church and certainly people I talk to in, out in the, in the world. The myth goes something like this. If you're faithful, if you're a, a faithful, church-going, sincere Christian, obedient to God as best you can be, then your life ought to go relatively smoothly. You ought not to have the trouble that those who aren't faithful and are disobedient have. Do you know, do you, have you heard this before? Felt this? There's a genuine misunderstanding out there. It's common in our culture, even in our church, that says if you're obedient and faithful and, and sincere in your belief, then your life should be smooth sailing, at least relatively so. This is not only profoundly unbiblical, it's really dangerous spiritually. Here's why it's dangerous. It's dangerous because people then begin to evaluate their own faith based on how their life is going in a given moment, in a snapshot. And when, things, when struggle comes, when pain comes, when opposition comes, and it does come, you either have, are left with one of two solutions. Either my faith isn't good enough because I shouldn't have this struggle, or my God isn't good enough. One of the two. And I sense this from people all the time. I work as a pastor. Why? Because they have a foundational misunderstanding about what the Christian life is supposed to be. Now, I'm not saying the Bible says, if you obey God, your life will be miserable, but you get to heaven. That's not what it says. There's great joy and fulfillment in living for Christ, but it's not always smooth sailing. We do not run unopposed. The reality of opposition. This is simply not at all the picture the Bible paints. Nehemiah is a prayerful man. He's a humble man. He's an honest man. He's a courageous man. He's a man taking great risks to do God's work. And he faces great opposition. Great struggle. And who has ever been more faithful, more obedient, more godly than Jesus Christ? And is his life smooth sailing? Even before, even before he went to the, the sham of a trial and he went to the cross, he said to his own disciples and those who would follow him, foxes have holds, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He was a homeless guy. They didn't, his followers did not get rich, did not have comfy lives following him. And Jesus, like Nehemiah, faced a similar kind of opposition in this text, right? What does Sambalot do? I, 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 when I read the scripture, I try to imagine it. Now, that gets weird because I have a strange mind. But if you put your mind, you try to imagine what it's really like. So Sambalot is kind of the ringleader. He's always mentioned first. He's the first one to speak. He's, sort of, he's, the, he's the leader in Samaria, the governor in that region. He's got his army sort of uh, arrayed there against the Jews. And he's the one shouting these taunts. And he's taunting them. Who else? was taunted at doing the will of God. Save yourself if you're the king of the Jews. Come on down from the cross. Right? Even by those dying next to him, taunted him. I think Tobiah is kind of like, he's like the sidekick, the evil sidekick. There's the evil overlord, Sambalot, and, it's, and he's the, Tobiah is like, yeah, yeah, even if a fox was on it, it would fall down. Yeah, yeah, like he's like the little guy next to him who's calling stuff out, you know. That's just in my head, you know. He probably is no threat without Sambalot, but he gets courage from this guy. And at first it's just mockery, but we'll see there's some interesting things in that as we go. So let's talk about opposition, the re reality of opposition. It's not necessarily every or any difficulty in your life. Opposition is not necessarily um, the heart, the struggle. You may have pain in your life, it might be God refining you. Opposition is not necessarily something that stands in the way of what you want what stands in the way of what God wants for you. So this is a good, I think, working de definition for us in this text in our lives. Opposition, spiritually speaking, is anything or anyone that threatens your perseverance in the faith or in doing the work of God. So anything or anyone that threatens your trust and faith in, in who God is, the God of the Scriptures, or anything or anyone who threatens your perseverance in doing what God wants you to do, that's opposition. Not necessarily hardship, not necessarily pain, although it could be. In this sense, we all face opposition. 
Anything that ever causes you to doubt the goodness of God that's opposed to God's will in your life because he wants you to know that he's good all the time. Anything or anyone that causes you to give up on doing what you know God wants you to do, that's opposition. Anything or anyone that gets in your way and causes you to doubt that God hears prayer, that God answers prayer. In this sense, we all face opposition. In fact, I would go so far as to say we're surrounded by it. We're surrounded in our culture by forces and people who are not even consciously so, but opposed to what God wants in our lives, giving us counter messages, tempting us, threatening us to lose faith, to give up. In fact, I want to show you the situation that Nehemiah and those with him were facing. You'll see an image of a map here. This is uh, the map, uh, apart from the red letters in circle, is just mod the modern day Middle East. But uh, you'll see there in red, you've got to the north, the Samaritans, to the west on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea, the Ashdodites, and to um, the east there, the Ammonites, and to the south, the Arabs. Those are the four regions that we see over and over again opposing Nehemiah. Quite literally, on all sides, the governors and the rulers of these regions, now remember, they're under Persian rule, but they sort of are autonomous in that region. They're opposed to God rebuilding, to Jerusalem being rebuilt. That's a threat to them, and they don't want to see it happen. On all sides, Nehemiah and his followers find themselves surrounded by those who don't like him, who don't think much of them, who mock them. Now, I don't want to stretch this too far, but I, I don't think it is a stretch to say that it's, it's sometimes being a Christian in today's American culture feels like this. Like we're surrounded on the political side, on the economic side, on the academic side, on the social side, by people who think, eh, you know, you're narrow-minded, you're intolerant, it's archaic, it's outdated. I mean, get, come on, get with, you don't really believe all that stuff, do you? I feel that way sometimes, I don't know if you do. So how do, how do we respond then? How do we respond? Let's talk about what it means to respond in a biblical manner to opposition, responding to opposition. In fact, this question really, uh, this issue, is the heart of the whole narrative, responding to the opposition, obeying God and responding to the opposition when it comes. And I would go so far as to say it's kind of at the heart of what it means to live as a Christian today, responding to opposition. So the litmus test then for authentic faith, get this, is not whether or not you face opposition. You will. It's how you respond to it. Go back to that myth, right? The litmus test for genuine faith is not the absence of opposition in our lives, not smooth sailing. That's not, the, that's not a sign of true faith. The litmus test for us in our faith is how do we respond when it comes. The story of Nehemiah shows us at least three responses. Not surprising, a Baptist pastor would have three responses, but we have three. There's probably a lot more in there, but I'll condense it to three. Three responses to opposition for those who follow God. First one, responding with prayer. Responding with prayer. This is a constant theme over and over in the book of Nehemiah. In fact, I almost wanted to sort of skip over this one because I've talked about it at length in previous sermons and others have as well. But I thought, you can't skip over this. It's all over the text. In fact, we, I don't want to move too quickly through here. That we'll come back to verse 2 where, where Nehemiah, or verse, excuse me, 4, Nehemiah has a pretty rough prayer against those who oppose him. We'll come back to that in a minute. Let's read verses 7 through 14. But when Sambalot and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites, that's the four you saw up there a minute ago, heard that the, re the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were being, beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as protection against them day and night. In Judah it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to, uh, to, to us ten times, you must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall and other open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. That's a really cool part of the story, isn't it? It gets better. Sambalot and his posse 
realize that the, the, the verbal insults, the mockery and the jeering is not getting it done. It only strengthens the people. The work continues. And so now they realize we've, if we're going to stop them, it's going to have to be more than shouting taunts at them. We're going to have to get serious. And they begin to, to organize. A real serious military threat is coming. It wasn't enough. It's very interesting. If you go back to verse uh, 6. So we built the wall, and the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Verse 7 then, they realize that that's not working. They get serious in the opposition. When does the intensity of the opposition come? When does it come? When the, when the work is what? Half done. I think there's a very important spiritual lesson for us in there. The wall was built to half its height. For a time, it's just shouting insults, which can be hurtful. It can be discouraging. The people's confidence probably ebbed and flowed, but they drew strength from Nehemiah, and there was no physical attack. But things ramp up when? When it's about half done. Anybody here have a half-finished project in their home? Come on, guys, let's be honest. Anybody have a half-finished project in their yard? Right now, as I'm speaking, if you went to my house, there are three projects, two outside, one inside, that are in, they're maybe not halfway, but they're not completed, right? Now let me ask another question. How long have they been that way? How long have they, yeah, some of you like, hey, 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 honey, don't look at him, don't listen. <laughs> I mean, starting out is exciting. Starting out is fun. I remember um, uh, a couple years ago, I had this grand idea to build this stone patio uh, kind of wrapping around the side of my deck and going to my back garage door. I had driven by on Route 25, a place where you could buy flagstone from Fox Excavating, as much as you could carry in your, in your car for like $75. So I went over there with my boys, we paid the money, we filled up my SUV till it was just barely this far off the, over the tires, drove home with the tires creaking, got home and probably had a thousand pounds or more of stone in there, unloaded it all, and it sat unloaded in my yard for a month. Then I thought, i got to do this thing, right? It, it, it took forever. Now I'm looking at it now, and I realize it all needs to be repaired because I didn't do it properly the first time. And so if you go to my house now, there's a, there's a poorly built flagstone patio with a bunch of new stones sitting on top of it. I just use them as chairs now. My kids sit on them. It's not getting done. You laugh. My wife doesn't. <laughs> Starting out is fun. You've got grand designs and visions about what it's going to be, right? And finishing is exciting because it's fulfilling. We completed the task. But the middle is hard. Spiritually speaking, the middle is hard. I, I, new Christians, full of excitement and joy and passion about that God loves them and has a plan for their life. Those who are near the end of their life, like my father-in-law, reflecting on all that God has blessed him with, all that God has given him, fulfillment, perspective, and joy. But sometimes in the middle, raising kids, trying to do your job and be a good husband or wife and just, just, or, or just a person, it's hard. The middle is sometimes difficult. It's a struggle. I think we see that here. Opposition comes when they're about halfway done. When it's not easy. In fact, in verse 10, you see, we see this, uh, we can kind of dissect uh, the opposition. There's this rumor spreading about the threat of invasion, and the people are beginning to talk. And one thing that we see in verse 10 is there's too much rubble. The job is too hard. I did not realize it was going to be this difficult. This is way beyond us. Too much rubble. We can't do it on our own. In verse 11, there's, the, there's insecurity, right? The, the, the enemies are saying they're never going to see us because of all the rubble and all the chaos. We'll be on them before they even see us coming. And the Jews are hearing about this. And then in verse 12, their own people, Jews living outside of Jerusalem, are saying 10 times, give it up. Give it up. It's a lost cause. I'll never forget when I was, uh, we were down in the south side of Chicago many, many years ago when I was youth pastor here. We took a, a group of students to the south side and we were working on some projects. One of the projects was to beautify and clean up vacant lots, which were really a mess in this really, really depressed neighborhood. And because the city would give these lots to this Christian center if they made plans to, to build them eventually and if they kept them up, mowed, fenced, cleaned up, and so forth. And so we had a group of high school students from the Tri-Cities out there. In, this is in the, right near the Englewood neighborhood in the far south side, just in the Roseland area. And we're picking up glass and, and other things out of this uh, lot. And we're, we're painting a, a brick kind of a surrounding. We're building a little mini fence, planting flowers. And it was just in the middle of this really rough neighborhood. And I remember this one fellow came walking down the street. And he stopped there. And he had a drink in his hand. And he watched us for a while. And he said, <laughs> that's a lost cause, y'all. And then just walked on by. He lived in that neighborhood. He's laughing at us, saying, he, I mean, he's from the neighborhood, saying, 
what are you doing? This is a lost cause. I remember students that looking at me saying, it, kind of, is it? <laughs> are, we, are we wasting our time here? Is it a lost cause? I think sometimes, spiritually speaking, we're tempted to think that. Is it really worth it, living for Christ? I mean, really, sometimes it seems like the wicked win in life. Sometimes it feels like all this effort to do what God wants, what does it really get me? Is it really worth it? That's opposition. How does Nehemiah respond? How do the people respond? In verse 9, we prayed to our God. We prayed to our God. In fact, if you go back to verse 2, you see a very clear, specific kind of prayer. Uh, let's read that prayer again in verse 2. And he said, the, uh, I'm sorry, not verse 2, verse 4. I keep saying 2, it's verse 4. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. Let's be honest. Nehemiah sounds a little hot here, doesn't he? Sounds a little ticked off. Sounds a little on the angry side. It almost sounds inappropriate to pray that God would, would thump them, would not remember their sin, would, de would deliver judgment on them. Now, he's not alone in this prayer. You read through the psalm, Psalm 58, 6, the psalmist prays, break their teeth in their mouth, O Lord. Anybody ever pray that prayer? Right? <laughs> now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that every sentiment expressed in prayer in the Bible is a godly sentiment. What I am saying is, the proper place for your anger and violent inclinations against opposition of, in your life and from God is not at the person, it's to God. That's where we vent it. I think it's appropriate, not necessarily what Nehemiah said, we could hash out the theology of that, but what's appropriate is that he takes his, his indignation and his violent instinct and he goes to God with it. Because God alone knows how to deal with Nehemiah and knows how to deal with those who oppose him. That's the right place to go with it. And that's what Nehemiah does. It's a rough prayer. I think it's important to notice also that he does not engage in a verbal, uh, a battle of, of insults. He doesn't lash back. He doesn't scheme against them. He doesn't engage with them on their level at all. Proverbs 26, 4, do not answer a fool according to his folly or you'll become just like him. Nehemiah avoids that and says, I'm not going to engage in that, but I'm angry. This isn't right. Where do I go with that anger? Do I let it fester and poison my own heart? Do I, let, do I bury it so it leaks out in some other relationship? Do I lash out at those people? Or do I displace it at somebody I love? Or do I take that and I give it to God? That's what he does. And I think that's absolutely appropriate. So let me ask you this question, we'll move on. Is prayer your first response? When pain, trouble, opposition comes, is your first response to give it to God? Or is it more of a last resort? You can ponder that as we move on. The second thing we see is responding with action. Responding with action. Look at the second half of verse 9. Nehemiah says, We prayed to our God and we set a guard against our enemies. We prayed and set a guard. We did both the prayerful thing and the practical thing. Let's read verses 15 through 21 now, the rest of the story here. When our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah. Now, now I, when I was reading this, I just, my mind again, I thought, okay, which is the better job? You want to be the guy, like, I wonder if, like, you know, is it break time yet? I want to hold the spear, you know, anyway. Who were building the wall? To those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and the officials, the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. That's the best job, the trumpeter, I think. You follow Nehemiah around all day long, and it's a, you blow one blast and everybody comes running. That'd be the coolest job, I think. But anyway, back to the story. So we labored at the work and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night with Jeru within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and a labor by day. So neither I, nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men nor of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. 
There's a lot in here. They return to the wall, each to his own work. The often overused expression in Christian parlance, let go and let God, have you ever heard that? I don't even like that expression sometimes because I think it's misunderstood and misused. It's not a cry for inaction. It's not a, 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 it's not a rationale for doing nothing. If Nehemiah teaches us anything, he teaches us this, that people of prayer are to be people of action. They're not separate things in God's economy. The most prayerful people are the most active people in God's kingdom. It ought to be that way. If it isn't, we should do a check and look at our own hearts. Nehemiah does not take this threat as a sign that he should uh, stop the work. He doesn't take this opposition as a reason to rethink and, re- and reevaluate. He's convinced that this is what God wants him to do. How does he know this? Deep prayer and deep experiences of God's faithfulness to him already. We'll come back to that in a minute. The action that Nehemiah takes is not a call to call a meeting, not to appoint a council to deal with the bad public, uh, uh, the bad PR, not at all to uh, hold a vote, but to continue doing what he knows God has called him to do. I've been thinking about this in my own life. Sometimes opposition comes and the enemy's ploy is not necessarily, it's just to get you distracted enough over here so you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing in your own family, in the workplace, with your children, in your relationships, just to get you worried or preoccupied so you stop doing the simple fundamental things that God has called you to do, which you know without a doubt you're supposed to be doing. Sometimes that's the most effective opposition in our life. They respond with action. The whole account in Nehemiah, uh, this this part of Nehemiah, reminds me of a phrase in the New Testament which happens over and over again, the phrase, watch and pray, or keep watch and pray. Jesus uses this, Paul uses this, Peter uses this phrase. It sort of combines the divine part, prayer, and the human part, watch. For us, I think this means that God has called us, his faithful followers, to be at the same time people of deep prayer and people of courageous action. I, I'm ask you this question. Which way do you lean? Which way does your heart lean? Do you tip more toward the prayer side? Somebody else is the active, activist. I'll pray for them. Or are you more on the acti- act- action side? Let's do something and they can pray for us. I think to, ha- to have a balanced and robust faith, God's called us to be at the same time, men and women, young and old, of deep prayer and of courageous action. So Nehemiah responds with prayer, responds with action. Finally, I want to point out um, that actually all the people, not just Nehemiah, respond with or in faith, responding with faith. Look at verse 14, if you have your Bible. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, the officials, the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Then this word, remember the Lord. That is such an important phrase for the people of God then and now. Remember the Lord. That word remember is the Hebrew word zakar. It literally means to see again. Invoke, call to mind, bring to mind, to bring before our spiritual eyes once again our God. That's what he's saying. Look with your eyes of your heart, Paul says that our hearts have eyes. See again what God has done in your life, what he's done throughout history. Remember the Lord. Why, why, over and over again in the Old Testament, nearly 150 times are God's people told to remember? Because we are forgetful people, are we not? I don't just mean you forget where you put your keys or you forget where you have to be tomorrow afternoon. I mean, spiritually speaking, we're forgetful people. We're easily distracted. Like in that movie, Up, Squirrel, you know? There are things that just, just grab our attention and pull us away from what God wants for us. I'm that way spiritually. I know that you are too. Part of what we do when we gather to worship God and sing those songs, part of the reason the words are up there is to remember. That's true. This is true. Because we forget, we doubt, we question. Nehemiah says, don't be afraid of them. He doesn't just, it's not just stop doing this. The, The antidote for fear is remember. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Don't give in to them. Remember the Lord. He fights for us. He has, he does, and he will. It's such an important thing for us, not just in the Old Testament, but for us today. We live in a world that I think seems to cause spiritual memory loss. 
we need to remember. Verse 2 of chapter 4. Verse 2. What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from the heaps of rubble? You see that? Can they bring those stones back to life from the heaps of rubble? That, that's intended as an insult. This is Sambalot's words saying, who do you think you are? You gonna finish this project? You gonna bring these stones back to life even if they, they're destroyed and burned as they are? You know the irony is? That's exactly what they're tr- counting on God to do. Yeah, the answer to that question, to all those questions, he's asking questions as a mockery here. What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish? Will they, rec- will they bring the stones to life? The answer to those questions is yes. Yes, they will. Why? Because their God is with them. Consider the phrase, will they bring the stones back to life? Ezekiel 36, 26. We'll skip over the Isaiah passage if you don't mind. We don't have quite the time for that. Ezekiel 36 to 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Or Matthew chapter 3, verse 9. God is able to raise up out of these stones for himself children of Abraham. Exactly what Zambalot and the enemies of God are taunting them with is precisely what God is using. And what is Nehemiah's prayer? Put their taunt back on their own heads. Turn it around on him, God. Isn't the cross the greatest turnaround in history? Save yourself if you can. He can. But he doesn't to save us. Turns the whole thing around. I think Nehemiah, in many ways that we don't quite grasp at first reading, is a foreshadowing of the gospel. That the opposition is that which, that which those who oppose God intend for evil, God takes and turns and says, see, that's exactly what I'm doing, bringing these stones to life. And quite frankly, now this... This might cause spiritual brain explosion. Peter calls us living stones. You sitting here tonight and today, if you trust in Jesus Christ, in in his death on the cross as payment for your sin, if you've turned over your life to him, not perfection, but if you have said that he's my only hope, I give my life to him, I trust him now and forever. If that's true about you, you 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 are evidence that Nehemiah was right that the book of Nehemiah was right. It's not about the wall. Will will they bring these stones to life? Yes, yes, they will. Through Jesus Christ, turns hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. Turns people that are dead into living stones. What does Paul say in Ephesians 2? We together are being joined in him and built together on the foundation on the apostles and prophets of which Christ Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone. We as the church here and around the world are evidence that Nehemiah knew what he was talking about that our God will and does fight for us. So last question. Who or what is a threat to your faith or to you doing the work God has called you to do? I should ask you to write it down, but we're over time. Who or what in your life is a threat to your faith and trust in God or to you doing what you know in your heart God has called you to do? What will you do about that? How will you respond to that? That's the test of mature faith. Let's pray. God, we worship you and we thank you and praise you for this ancient story which gives us life and hope in our day. That you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. You are the God who fought for Nehemiah and the Jews so many centuries ago. And you are the God who fights for us today. And you have conquered sin and death and hell at the cross. And we praise and worship you and rejoice that we now have the victory. The battle is won. And that whatever stands against us will fall because of you. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.